There we go. So we're now recording. All right. So very good. Well, welcome to CISP 362. It's programming for mobile devices one, which means there's also a two, and two is going to be offered in the spring next semester. So usually what I do is I combine at least two uh, 362s to offer one 363 because most of the time I don't get a whole lot of people to move on to 363. So, um, so that's why you know, this is the second semester in a row that I offer a 362. And the class seems to be feeling, okay, I think we have at least 22 students, so the class won't be canceled, which is good. They are canceling classes you know, with less than 22 students en enrollment. Okay, um, so what I'm doing here is I'm going through the uh, interactive syllabus. I'm just routing my cables a little bit better so I don't get, uh, my hand won't you know, get entangled in the cables. All right, so this is the uh, interactive syllabus. Uh, some of you may have seen it already, but if you have not, you have to complete the interactive syllabus before the material of this class is available to you. But let's, let me start from scratch, okay? So where are we, how do we get here? That's the question. So I'm gonna close the screen entirely, open a new tab, just so that I can show you exactly how to get to the website that you need in order, for this, uh, in order to read and the material and also participate <coughs> in activities in this class. The website is moodle.lostreels.edu. I'm going to write it down on the whiteboard too. It's M-O-O-D-L-E, moodle.lostreels.edu. You don't need to give it the HTTPS. It will redirect when you go to this website and make sure that you get a secure connection. Right, so this is on the whiteboard. You know, you don't. So I can move on with the web uh, browser here. So once you get in, you will see something like this. Um, you know, I signed in already, and that's why you know you see it here. So I'm I'm, sign, I'm gonna sign out just so that you can see what it looks like when you sign in. And I'm also gonna zoom out. This is the usual look of the website. So for you guys, you want to type your W and seven-digit student ID as your username. The password is going to be the same that you use with D2L and e-services. Okay. Are there any questions about your student <coughs> ID or your usual district password? So everybody knows all that stuff, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna sign in, but I'm gonna use my usual professor sign-in authentic authentication. And once you sign in under my courses, you will see a list of classes that you are taking with various professors. Probably just one for you guys because you know I think there are only like eight professors in the entire district using this particular uh, LMS or learning management system. So on this list here, you should find CISP 362, Programming for Mobile Devices. So you click that and that will bring you to this class. So in the in the actual class, I'm going to zoom in, you know, just because you know the text is a little bit small for people sitting in the back. So what I usually do is I zoom in until one of the columns go away. And I was on interactive syllabus before, so I'm going to get back to it and continue my last preview. And for you guys, you know, it will look like a quiz. It will tell you it's a quiz, but it's really just a syllabus. All right, so let's go through the syllabus quickly so that we can actually get into the programming part of this class. This part here is just copied and pasted from the schedule, okay? So there should be no surprises here. Um, it's a four unit class, you know, because we do have a lab after the lecture. The lab is gonna be in room 125, which is at the other end of this aisle of buildings. So we'll all be moving to 125 at the end of the lecture. This class does have a co-requisite, okay? So you do, you need to be either taking one of these two classes in the same semester or have taken one of these two classes prior to this semester. CISP 300 is algorithm design and problem solving and CISP 370 is visual basic program. Okay, so are there any questions about the co-requisite? Good questions? Okay, very good. All right. So, yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So, if I'm on the wait list, 
for like 300. Mm -hmm. um, will I get dropped from this class? I'm not going to drop anyone, you know, within the first week or so unless, you know, those people stop showing up. So, but I won't, you know, drop you because you have not met the co-requisite requirement. Okay. But you do want to make sure that you get in in order to continue with this class. So if I don't, because I'm pretty low on the, on the wait list, if I don't get <laughs> in, am I out of, like, both? Um, yes, potentially, unfortunately. Um, I think there's a Saturday class for CISP 302, so if Saturday is an option for you, you know, you might want to try that one. I saw that one. I'm in a Saturday class already. So oh, you I'll, are? Yes. I'll, I'll figure I'll talk to you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, no problem. All right. So this is the lecture. You know, the lecture is in this room, 121, and then 126 is the lab. So I, I just lied because I said the 120 five which is down this hallway but it's actually 126 which is even closer it's just across on the other side of this door okay very good the final exam of this class you might want to put this on your calendar like right now I know most of you have a either a electronic calendar or a paper calendar it's on December 14th the Wednesday and the starting time of the final exam is 10 15 this is not a typo I copy this from the schedule directly it is 10 15 to 12.15, okay? So make sure you have that block of time reserved for the final exam for this class. So that's about all I need to talk about for the section, for this particular section. And for each quote unquote question in the syllabus, basically what you do is you select one or the other as quote unquote the answer. So either you say, yes, this is the correct class in the correct section, I intend to stay in this class, or you say, this is not the class that I want to be in, please drop me if I'm already on roster, okay? So from the uh, reaction from you guys, I'm assuming that all of you are in the right class because you know, I don't see anyone walking out of the classroom right now. <laughs> Okay, the next section talks about me, okay? My first name is Tak, T-A-K, and last name is Aoyoung, which is an approximation of a Cantonese last name. Um, it's not even close, so just call me Tak. That's perfectly okay. <clears throat> uh, by the way, my last name is also a hyperlink to bring you to a Wikipedia page of this particular last name. I'm not even interested, but I just put it up here, so, so it's just in case somebody is interested. Um, this is my email address, uh, drtag2016 fall at gmail.com. Um, I just use a new account every semester, so this way, you know, I don't get, you know, it, it's just a whole lot easier for me to organize stuff this way. My phone number is 916-484-8250. Office is door number three in Liberal Arts 133. I see a few faces here that is familiar, okay? My office used to be number seven, and now they move it to number three. And so just, you know, if you thought you knew where my office was, okay, it has moved. My office hours <coughs> are eight to nine o'clock on each day from Monday to Friday, so it's easy to remember. If you want to arrange a different time to talk to me because you know you, this is too early for you to get on campus, um, we can probably arrange a time after the lab is done with this class. So just let me know, you know if you need to arrange a different time to talk to me. <clears throat> if you need to leave a message or an email, uh, you want to indicate your actual name as registered at ARC and also which class you're in, because otherwise I cannot give you an answer, okay? If I get a question like, um, when is the next exam, and somebody used a Gmail that has no actual usable name and did not indicate which class, I wouldn't know how to answer that question. Okay. Presentation slash delivery methods. Um, I use a combination of video clips, reading material for the most part, and interactive activities to teach the class. Um, this part has to do with whether I remain um, interactive when I'm teaching this class. And since this is a 100% face-to-face class, in order for me not to meet this requirement, I have to be looking at the whiteboard like this and talk the entire time 
and not answer your questions despite your people screaming and say, Jack, we got questions, then I would not meet the regular effective contact uh, requirement. This is mostly for online classes, okay? How many people are taking online classes this semester? Okay, how many people have taken online classes before? How many people have taken an online class where it seems to be very robotic, like you don't get contacted by the professor, you just have to do the homework and it's automatically graded? This is for those classes, okay, to remind the professors that they do have to initiate communication with students to make sure the students are in class, making progress, and, you know, just encourage, you know, questions and, and uh, discussions. So we don't have that problem, but I do want to outline resources that are available to you. The first one is office hours, because I find that my office hours are usually underutilized, okay? So if you have any questions, you know, just stop by my office hours and, you know, we can chat about stuff. Uh, lab time, this class does have a lab component, which is right after the lecture. That's also a very good resource if you just want to get some, you know, um, I wouldn't say un undivided, but if you want some additional help or just want to talk about stuff a little more, the lab time is a good time to do it. Um, oh, I got it. I don't have office hours online this semester because it's all face-to-face. -face. If you guys want to turn on forums, we can do that with this class. Now, it's kind of helpful with this class because we are, going to, we are going to do stuff on computers. So, and after Wednesday, we won't be meeting until the following Monday. So we have four days of no meetings at all. So turning on the forums can be helpful, you know, in case you have some questions over those four days that you want answered. Um, I will respond to email and, you know, and phone calls within 24 hours, but if you post a question on the forums, another student may be able to get back to you like within minutes, okay? I don't know how frequently people check the forums, but that's a, that's a resource as well. Um, messaging on Moodle, okay, you, know, you can get to me that way too. And also there's just the usual stuff, email and phone. Time frame is I get back to you, I will get back to you within 24 hours, but over the weekend it's going to be 48 hours. Um, etiquette policy, you know, is really mostly just common sense stuff to make sure that this class this class remains as a safe place, and you know we just you know stay on topic when we communicate either by forum or in class and stuff like that. So it's mostly just common sense stuff. Okay, nothing offensive. Nothing that you know, basically can be considered as harassment or discrimination. No cyberbullying and no spamming. Okay, so just usual stuff. You know, at least in my in my mind, that's that's just usual stuff. But I do want to kind of lay this out just to make sure that everybody understand that you know inappropriate language is not going to be tolerated in this class. Any questions about all this stuff? Questions? All right. <clears throat> so first day of class for orientation. So anyone who's missing the first day of class will be dropped, okay? I don't see too many people being concerned here because you're here, the first class. So you guys are fine, don't worry. So I'm gonna, that reminds me that I'm gonna pass the row sheet just so they have a record that you are here. So we'll start here. <coughs> yep. FYI, I'm trying to add this class. Okay, if you're adding to the class, you know, I have some space at the end of the list. Just add your name and you know, still initial uh, under the right date. I need a um, permission number also. Okay, so I can do that um, probably at the end of the lecture or you know, in the lab time. Okay, moving on, accommodations. Um, ARC does have a lot of resources for students who have disabilities or require accommodations otherwise. I cannot provide any accommodations myself, okay? Um, so if you need accommodations, you want to contact the DSPS office on campus. The phone number is right here, 484-8382, okay? So you definitely want to contact those people. I can provide accommodations when it comes to extra time for assessment, but only with a piece of paper from the DSP <coughs> saying so. Okay, so if you think you need uh, accommodations, go to the DSPS office and talk to those people over there. Excessive absences, okay. Um, 
this is a district policy. Six percent or more unexcused absences is considered excessive. Okay, so I just want to give you the bottom line because there's a lot of stuff here that I have written. So the bottom line is for a class like this, one class is about 2.5 percent of the entire semester, which means uh, people can miss two classes unexcused without any problems. The third absence is going to be excessive. And excessive absences can lead to being dropped. So you definitely don't want to miss too many classes. Being late is okay. You know, some people, you know, just don't even bother to get into the classroom because they're half an hour late or something like that. I don't want to condone people doing it. I don't want to encourage people for being late. But occasionally being late a little bit is not a big problem. Okay, just don't make it a habit. Not a problem if you're half an hour late. Just walk in late. Um, the only thing I ask is close the door softly so that the rest of the class don't get disturbed. All right. So in this class, I use a row sheet to kind of keep my attendance. Unexpected events will happen in life, and that's what the 6% is, uh, is for. I mean, you know, so people can afford to miss two classes without excuse. But there are certain absences that has to be excused by district policy. If you are sick and you went to see a doctor or a nurse, you know, just go to Kaiser and you know whoever, you know, any type of practitioner is going to say, well, you know, I think you're not really going to be going to school for a few days. Okay, you're not. You should not go to school because you may be contagious. Maybe you're, you're just not fit. Your your health does not allow you to go back to school for a few days. If I get a piece of paper saying that, that has to be excused. Okay? But that's the only type of excuses that I have, that's the only type of absences that I am obligated to excuse. Is that okay? Does, that, does everybody need, understand what that means? So if you're sick, okay, you definitely want to get a documentation if you want it to be excused. All right. So other types of absences are not necessarily excused, which includes you know religious holidays, family occasions, job interviews, work-related issues, car problems, transportation problems, childcare problems, and so on. Okay. Now, trust me, you're not the only ones with these type of things happening in life. You know they happen to me as well. Probably not job interviews. But uh, you know, other stuff happens to me too. Okay, so when you're taking a class, you kind of have to, you, you have to make the commitment to come to class regularly, and you do have the two uh, unexcused absences. So you can use those two for a variety of reasons of not being able to come to class. Late policy is easy. I do not accept late work unless it is because of health reasons. So you know, just make sure you turn in your homework on time and make sure that you remember, you know, pay attention when the first and the second exams are and get to the exams on time as well. <clears throat> oh, this is new too. In the event of sickness, please notify me or let me know as soon as possible. I know sometimes this is really hard because you know, a person who is really sick in bed is unlikely to get out of bed just to email me and say that, oh, I'm sick, you know, I cannot get to class. So if possible, let me know. Either you can tell your family to let me know, tell your friends to let me know. Just somehow let me know that you are sick and that's the reason why you missed a, you know, an exam or something like that. The reason is, you know, when I usually use the session right after an exam to talk about the answers. So if I knew somebody is sick, I would defer that so that that person can take the exam late and I don't have to make up a new exam. But if I don't know about it and I talk about the solution to the test, and that person comes back and say, oh, I was sick last week and I couldn't come to class, I cannot use the same exam anymore. I will have to make a new exam for that person. The next section talks about academic integrity slash dishonesty, 
which is basically flip sides of each other. <coughs> so the bottom line is um, you know, academic dishonesty, which is you know, a form of cheating, occurs when a student attempt to, attempts to show possession of a level of competency, knowledge, or skill beyond the level of the student or help another student to achieve the same thing. I don't, I don't really care how it is done, okay? It's just that you know, when a particular person um, is attempting to show a level of competency, knowledge, or skill beyond the actual level, that you know, constitutes you know, cheating. Are there any questions about that part? Okay. So the flip side of this is the positive stuff that I really should be talking about is academic integrity. So that means the grade of a particular assessment of a particular student should reflect the academic, academic performance of the student and only of that student who turned in the assessment work at the approved scheduled time of the assessment, following all the rules of the assessment, and only using resources that are permitted for that particular assessment. Common sense stuff, okay? But I'm just spelling it out so that there won't be any uh, ambiguity of what I consider as academic integrity. And this is a limits test to see whether you know academic integrity was preserved. If I suspect something, okay, and it's only a suspicion, I don't have any actual solid proof, then I can give a person an alternate test that is that's going to go over the same topics at the same difficulty level. And the idea is if that person scored a really good score in the original assessment, that person should score something similar in the alternate uh, assessment. So if that person scored a very low score in the alternate assessment, then you know, that person has failed the litmus test for academic integrity. Okay. Now, Somebody can complain and say, hey, your alternate test is a lot harder than the original. That's fine. In that case, I'm going to give the alternate test to other students as well, just to see what is the distribution. And if that distribute, if the, if, if the student that is in question is not following that trend, then I will still have sufficient reason to have my suspicion. Okay, but normally I don't really have to go that far because if I have any proof of dishonesty to begin with, I don't need to administer the limits test. And this part here is really just explaining the rationale of why I value uh, academic honesty or integrity. It has to do with preserving the reputation of the college, but not for the sake of the college. It's for the sake of, your, of other students who are actually honest. Okay. Now, just kind of imagine that ARC became, became, became well known for academic, academic dishonesty, cheating. Okay? It's just rampant. And universities know about that too. What's going to happen? How, how many people here are on a transfer track? Okay? So what's going to happen you know, when you try to transfer? to Sac State or UC Davis, what's going to happen? They don't want to accept you from Because you're coming from ARC, and ARC is known to have problems with cheating. Because your grade doesn't have any weight anymore. Okay? You know, anyone who's getting an A or a B doesn't mean anything because it does not actually, you know, it, if there's a high probability, it does not actually reflect the capability of the student. So, that means the universities will basically just say, we are not going to articulate with ARC anymore. And that's going to hurt the 99% of students who are actually honest. And that's why, you know, in my mind at least, you know, that's why I value uh, academic integrity in all of my classes. Including this one. You know, this one is not even going to be, it's not one of those classes where other universities would actually count as one of their own classes. Okay, most of you are taking this class just because you're interested, you're curious, you just want to learn something about mobile programming. 
Moving on, student rights and responsibilities is not really required, okay? This section is not required by the college or the division, but I, I threw it in just so that you guys have a link to not only your responsibilities, but also your rights as students, okay? If you feel that you're wrongfully accused by a professor, what can you do? Well, this will tell you what you can do and the resources available to you. Expected classroom behavior, okay? I just want to make sure the classroom is, uh, is free of disruption, free of discrimination and harassment, okay? I just want this to be a safe environment for everybody to learn new things, for me to teach stuff and so on, okay? How to attend lectures. Um, let me just check one thing before I move on any further, because I just want to make sure that my recorder is actually on. And I'll do it one more time, and I just have to compare <coughs> the size of the, these two. Okay, so the video is recording. Your disk space capacity isn't going down. My disk space is? Yes, yes it's in the bottom left. Space. Oh, when you started, if you, it's behind the dock right now. When you started, it's in six hours and eleven oh. minutes of space. Oh, okay. Ten minutes ago, it was like okay. six hours and one minute. So chew, it's chewing up space, yeah. but not necessarily actually recording. <laughs> but I think it's recording. Um, the only big question is audacity because it doesn't save anything until the very end of this class. So I just have to make sure that this application doesn't get killed in the process. Okay, so getting back to how to attend lectures, I think most of you have attended enough lectures that you kind of know how to do it. This class is a lot more applied, which means you know I'm gonna show you guys how to write mobile applications, which has a lot of interactive stuff on the screen, you know, not really so much you know step by step, you know, steps. So what you want to do is not try to copy what I do on the screen on your notebook, okay, because you will never be able to catch up. Okay? And when you try to you know, write stuff like that, you, know, you are not paying attention to me and understand the concepts. So let the screen recording do most of the work, the recording for you. And what you want to do is to focus on understanding the concepts and making sure that I explain the concepts correctly, you know, sufficiently. Okay? Keep asking questions. Okay? Slow me down. Ask me questions because sometimes I go a little bit too fast. <clears throat> Uh, how to succeed in my classes, not just this one, but most of my other classes. I really care about the understanding of the concepts mm -hmm. a whole lot more than what you can memorize. I can already tell you, some people have taken my classes before, so what is typical of my exams? Do I require any type of memorizations in my exams? It's open book and open notes. Okay? And with this class, it's going to be open web as well, as long as there is no interaction with another person during that time. So you don't have to memorize anything. Um, what I do want to make sure is you guys understand the concepts and be able to apply those concepts. Because understanding is important, but I cannot assess how much you understand just by looking at you, right? I mean, people can be nodding the entire class, but I have no idea whether they actually understand the concepts or not. And I'm not a mind reader. Okay? You know, it's good that I'm not a mind reader either. I don't want that. Okay? So how can I tell whether you understand the concepts or not? A test. Okay, very good. But in the tests, how, what kind of question do you think I can ask? To see if you understand, but see if you understand concepts, not just memorizing stuff. Hmm? Logical stuff, problem solving, right? So all the tests will involve problem solving. I'll give you a problem, and then you have to solve the problem by writing an application or a mobile app to solve that problem. Okay, that's how I can assess whether you understand the concepts and whether you can apply those concepts after understanding those concepts. So this is just a long section that talks about, explains what is understanding and what is you know, the application of the concepts and what is problem solving, okay? 
So it's a long section, but if you have any, I, if you have any doubt of what I consider as understanding and problem solving, please read it. Okay, and you can ask me questions about it too, if you have any type of questions. This part here is basically just talk about when do you give up and ask for help when you're doing your homework assignment. So let's say you're given a homework assignment, you spend. 15 minutes you know, in the homework assignment, and you get to a point where you don't really know how to proceed. Because very few, if any, <coughs> of my homework assignments involve busy work, okay? Most of those, if you know how to do it, it doesn't take you much time to get it done. So most of the time, you're just problem solving. You're trying to figure out how to solve the problem. So let's say, you know, after 15 minutes reading the homework assignment description, you come to the point where, well, I really don't, I'm not sure how to proceed with this homework assignment. The question is, what are you going to do at that point? Okay? Um, and this whole section basically talks about, you know, try to defer and wait a little bit before you ask someone to help you. It is okay to ask someone to help you, okay? It's not a problem. It's okay to have your you know, classmates to kind of talk about concepts together, but not so much to work on the homework assignments together, okay? But you guys can talk about concepts like, oh, I really don't understand what is event handling. Can you help me understand what is event handling? That's perfectly okay, but it's not as okay when you ask someone and say, well, I really don't know how to get this assignment done. Can you show me what your solution? That's not as okay, okay? So, but the question here is not even about that. It is about when do you ask? After 15 minutes, after half an hour, now all of your homework assignments have a due date of at least one week from the day of assignment. So when do you think is a good time to, uh, maybe I need some help, maybe I'll ask Pat or another person in the class. I wouldn't do it, yeah, go ahead. Just before you throw your computer at the room. <laughs> or tablet in this case. Yeah, tablet. <laughs> Tablets are easier to fly. They're, they're <laughs> much more uh, aerodynamic as a foil. <laughs> they, can, they can go further before hitting something or someone. <laughs> um, I would say give it at least a day, okay? Which also means you should start on your homework assignments as soon as possible, okay? So if I give you an assignment on Monday, okay, you try to solve the problem on and off the day, and then on Tuesday, if you just absolutely have no idea how to proceed, well, maybe you know, ask some questions, okay? Or on Wednesday in class, ask a few questions, okay? Just to make sure that you got the concepts down. But not 15 minutes, <laughs> not half an hour, okay? Because your brain needs time to solve problems, okay? What do you think is the distribution of IQ? of like the population. So if I draw a picture here, I think uh, in terms of IQ, 200 is the maximum because that means you know that person is 100 percentile, which means everybody is less intelligent according to the tests. And there's also a zero, okay? So what do you think this curve looks like? It's a bell curve. Hmm? Bell it's a bell curve, very good. Okay, so it's a bell curve that looks like this. So the majority <coughs> of people are gonna be in the middle where they're definitely smart enough to take this class and get things done, okay? But out of this portion of people, some people are, easy, are quicker to ask questions. They just go spend 10 minutes on the problem and go, ah, I give up. I'm gonna ask somebody else, okay? That's not gonna be helpful in a class like this because it might work out in homework assignments, but it's not gonna work in exams. So what I want to encourage people to do is to spend a little bit more time before asking. Okay, a lot of that really has to do with your personality type. Have you guys taken any type of a personality tests? Break Myers, okay, the four-letter thing. Okay, so tell me about the four-letter thing. <coughs> the first one is I versus E. What what does that mean? Interpersonal or extrapersonal? Or introverted in introvert and extrovert. versus extrovert, not pro. Okay, it's not introvert, it's extra introvert. Okay. So this determines when you have to solve a problem, do you feel more energized or feel more effective when you just kind of seclude yourself, you know, lock yourself in the room and think about it? 
or do you feel more energized or effective by talking to other people? Okay, extrovert means you like to interact with other people while you're solving a problem. Introvert means you like to kind of block yourself out, you know, to solve a problem. The next one is N versus <coughs> S. N is intuitive, S is sensory. You can look up all of this stuff on the web anyway. Intuitive means uh, those people like to deal with abstract concepts instead of sensory stuff. Sensory means you know those people need to have sensory input to really grasp concepts of you know of any kind. So I can give you an idea. Let's say you're a mechanic, okay? A intuitive person would just read up the torque spec of a you know lug nut or something like that, set the dial, and then just you know say, okay, when the torque wrench clicks, it's done. Okay. A sensory person has to experience it first because that person is not gonna trust the uh, numbers or the torque wrench, that person actually has to experience how much you know, force or how much torque, you know, uh, like the you know, uh, 23 pound you know, is, it feels like. Um, the next one is T versus F. T is thinking, F is feeling. Thinking means, you know, these people tend to solve problems by logic. They pay attention to logic and they like to pro solve problems. F is feeling, which means that these people pay attention to the feelings of other people. Okay. I'll give you one example. Okay, your friend comes to you and say, I'm so bummed, you know, my brownie just burnt, and you know, my toaster oven doesn't seem to be working, I'm so sad, okay? So a tea person will basically immediately jump in and say, okay, uh, show me your toaster oven, let me fix it. Or, you know, if it cannot be fixed, you know, let me give you a recommendation based on what I have read on Amazon, this model has got you know, really good automatic temperature control and digital stuff, blah, 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 blah. You know, in fact, I'm gonna pay for that so that you can make perfect brownies next time. That's what a tea person will do. A tea person doesn't mean that that person is not caring because you know, that person wants to solve a problem. That's their mentality is, I want to solve your problem. I'm your friend, I will solve your problems. A F person is a feeling person which pays attention to the emotion of the other person. Oh, I feel your pain. So let me come over to your house and bake brownies again, even if it's gonna be burnt, but this time I'll be with you to share your sadness. But it's gonna be burnt again. So that's okay, because I'm addressing your feeling, not your problem, right? Okay, so that's T versus F. And then the last one is P versus J. And this one is kind of uh, tricky to understand. P is pers perceiving, J is judging. Not judgmental, just judging, okay? The main difference is perceiving people do not easily classify things into good, bad, right, wrong, and stuff like that. It is just what it is, okay? They just perceive and accept things as they are, okay? J people tend to put things into bins, like good, bad, right, wrong, and stuff like that. Okay? And the result is interesting. A P person is very likely to be messy because they don't really feel that this thing has to be over there, that thing has to be over there. It's like, well, as long as I can find it, it's good enough. Okay? A J person is likely to keep a clean desk because everything has a proper space. Good. Okay? Um, if things is out of place, bad. Got to change that. Okay? So that's, those are the four main categories of um, dimensions of personalities according to the personality test, okay? So the reason I brought this up is I just want to kind of bring it up because um, there are certain type of personalities that are really well suited, like super well suited to become um, software engineers and programmers and stuff like that. Um, and then there are other personalities for other types of occupations. So I'm not gonna say which one is for which occupation, I'll let you guys find it out, but it's really helpful to understand what is your personality type, because you know, most websites that talk about or give you assessment for personality, type, for personality types would also give you recommendations <coughs> of all sorts, okay? What kind of occupation, how you interact with people, and stuff like that, and I personally feel that it is really helpful to me to understand myself a little bit better based on my personality types, okay? <clears throat> so let me show you one particular website that I really like. It's called 16personalities.com, I think.
think that's it. Could be wrong. Nope, this is it. Um, so this website is really mobile friendly as well. So you can do it on the mobile phone. Um, I think they give you like 50 questions that you have to answer. And at the end, it will give you a conclusion of, you know, they don't just give you a letter, okay? They give you a percentage. In other words, um, let's see. I am actually just borderline between I and E. So they'll just give me, they'll just say that I'm 60-ish percent introvert. So I'm not really leaning too much on one side and just going like, eh, just a little bit on the introvert versus the extrovert. But I'm 100% close to 100% thinking as opposed to feeling. So on, it will give you your, your actual coordinate in the four dimensional space, if you will. Okay? So it's, it's interesting. I, I, I highly recommend people to kind of take this test. If you don't like the results, hey, it's just take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> All right. So getting back to this stuff here, um, I also want to kind of point out that, that your mind is not an instant problem solving. Mind is not, OK? It's a slow cooker. I always use the slow cooker you know, analogy. So what I need to do to solve problems is I need to get the ingredients into the slow cooker turn it on, and then what I do is I just walk away, do something else, come back, check again, it's like, well, I think I need a little bit more salt, you know, put a little herb in, and then close the lid, walk away again, okay? Um, I think some people are gonna be bored. You're gonna be bored because you, you've heard this before, okay? So in my days as a graduate student, I encountered a particular proof, a theorem that I had to prove and I was kind of stumped, okay, for maybe a day or so. I was stumped and go like, ah, you know, I really don't know how to get from here to here. So I just kind of keep it in my back burner and I went to do other stuff. And 3 a.m. in the morning, in a dream, the proof was done. So I woke up from my dream and immediately grabbed, you know, a piece of paper and my pen and wrote it down, okay? And that was it, okay? The solution came to me in a dream. And it has to do with your subconscious. My subconscious continues to work even though I'm actually doing something else. But in the back of my mind, it is actually still working on the problem. Okay? So that's why I want you guys to give yourselves time to solve problems in a class. Okay? You know, don't expect the answers just to come like within 30 minutes. Okay? Sometimes it might ha take half a day or a day or even longer. Okay, so moving on. Well, study a little bit before class, but that can be helpful as well. Uh, grading standard, okay, so A, B, C, D, F, I'm pretty sure all of you are familiar with these letter grades already. A means excellent, B means good, C means satisfactory slash fair, D is a low pass, and F is a fair, okay? So you're all familiar with these terms already, but what does it mean when I have to give you a score in your homework assignment, in your exams, and stuff like that. And A means you gave me a perfect answer. Cannot be any better. Okay? That's pretty easy to understand. F <coughs> is easy to understand as well. If someone did not turn in anything, did not turn in anything on time, did not turn in anything according to the instructions, the wrong format, the wrong kind of file, there won't be any points. It's a failing grade. Or the answer does not show any understanding of the material and any ability to apply knowledge. Okay, so that's an F. Pretty easy to understand on both extremes. It's the center three, the middle three that are, eh, I don't know which way you know, to, which one to, uh, to use for graining. A B is basically saying it is still a really good answer, but it does have some mistakes or omissions. I can spot certain things that are either missing or wrong. On the other hand, the answer still shows understanding of the material and the ability to apply the knowledge involved that I'm trying to test. The execution is commendable, but it's not exactly perfect. Okay, Commendable. Okay. Are there any questions about what I consider as a B? when it comes to answers and stuff like that, homework assignments. Okay, A C is one below that. It really is, the answer, 
uh, has a lot of mistakes or omissions, but it still shows sufficient but incomplete understanding of the material. So I can see, I can see. Well, that person understands most of it, but not all of it. Okay. The execution has much to be desired. You know, lots of omissions, lots of mistakes, just kind of sloppy. Okay. A D is an answer that shows insufficient understanding of the material and the ability to apply the knowledge. So the execution is not even important in this case because there's not enough evidence of sufficient understanding. Okay. Are there any questions about the letter grade in terms of scoring? How many people think this is kind of boring? Okay. So let's think, let's think about A, B, C, D, F in stars for product evaluation. How many people have not ordered anything from Amazon? Okay, from any websites? <laughs> okay, so what do you do when you, when you try to make an online purchase of something? Let's say you need to buy a new computer, okay? When you, a new hard drive, okay, or something like that. So what do you do when you, when you shop online? So you try to read the reviews. Exactly. So you try to read the reviews on other people. Okay. And most websites you use a star system to evaluate products, right? You know, one star, two stars, and all the way up to five stars. So, so we can map the star system to A, B, C, D, F. And A is really the same, the same thing as five stars, and you just move all the way to one star as an F. So, what kind of product will earn a five star rating? From you. It arrived on time. It was exactly what it was supposed to be. Um, all expectations were met. And then some. And then some. And then some. You order something, it works as advertised, 100%, and then they give you a few surprises. It's like, oh, this is a neat feature. I did not even know that this product could do this. Okay? Or the product said, well, we can survive a, a you know, three foot drop onto concrete, okay? And then you carry that thing on the ladder and then it has a you know, 10 foot drop and the device continues to work, okay? That's a five star product because it meets and exceeds your expectations. You cannot find a single fault of any kind in the product. <coughs> a four star product is going to perform as expected, but there are certain minor things that you say, well, I really wish it did blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's say you're talking about a uh, USB charger, a portable charger. How many people play Pokemon Go? And Pokemon Go sucks badly like there's no tomorrow, so you need an external charger, right? So with an external charger like that, a four-star product is going to be something that works as expected, gives you the capacity and the charge current as promised. But there are certain things that you can kind of nitpick with it. It's like, well, the you know it, they could make it lighter, okay? Or the packaging is a little too bit too bulky, or the positioning of the two USB ports kind of can interfere if you have if you try to plug in two things at the same time, okay? So little things to nitpick, but for the most part, it does work as expected, okay? Just little things. A three-star product, on the other hand, is just acceptable. Okay, the plastic is really flimsy, okay? You put it in your backpack, you know, you throw your backpack around a little bit, and then the external charger just fell apart, okay? Or develop cracks and stuff like that. It's just like, eh, you know, but not quite enough for you to return the product. It's just like, well, I'm not gonna recommend it to my friends, but I'll keep using this until it's broken, okay? And you wish that it would get broken soon. A two-star product, does not perform and likely to be returned. So in the case of an external charger, this would be something that claims to have 5,000 million amp hour and only really gave you like 3,000, okay? So you expected two full charge of your cell phone, only gave you like one full charge and then the battery died, okay? Didn't quite meet your expectation, but it still functioned a little bit as an external charger. So you know that like, if you live really close to a UPS store, you will return it. But if it's too much of a, out of your way to drive to return it, it's like, uh, it's too much. 
too much work. I guess I'll still use it. I'll give it to my you know relative or something. Okay, that's a two-star product. What is a one-star product in the case of a battery charger? It doesn't work at all, or it's faulty, or it just it just goes up in flame by itself. <laughs> okay, faulty product. Okay, it doesn't work. So I hope this kind of helps you understand how I evaluate your submissions, you know, your answers, your homework assignments, and assign the A, B, C, D, F accordingly. Is that okay? Any questions about this? Nope, no questions. So in terms of how your percentage of score maps to letter grade, this is how it works out. Okay, from 0% to less than 12.5% is an F. 12.5% to just less than 37.5% is a D. 37.5% um, to 62.5% is a C. And 62.5% to less than 87.5% is a B. And anyone who gets at least 87.5% gets an A. So it maps just completely according to the GPA's you know, numbers. Any questions about this part? Yep. Is A7.5 A minus? Well, we don't have minus and plus in this column. So okay. it's just A, B, C, D, F. Okay. Any other questions? Does that mean this class is a lot easier than all of your other classes? Well, and why not? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I guess it depends what you're taking. But I, I remember in 310, the average on the exams was something like 60%. So Which is a B. Yeah. yeah, so that's, yeah. that's OK after <laughs> the scale. Yeah. But that's because I grade everything according to the scale. I don't give multiple choice tests to expect most people can answer at least 75% of the, of the questions. I do not have questions like that. I only have questions where I can apply the scale you know, in every single way. So that's why I can just use an average, also use this scale to assign the final grade letter. Okay. And Angela can probably tell the whole class about you know, how I test problem solving skills and not memorization. Because you know, the classes that she took was really all about problem solving. Okay, assessment activities, we have assignments. Okay, these are things that you can do at home. Usually I give you one week to get your assignments done. And that all the assignments will add up to 20% of your final grade. There are three exams. The first exam is 20% of your final grade. The second exam is another 20% of your final grade. The final exam itself is 40% of your final grade. So the final exam is kind of important, okay? Because if you ace the final exam, that's a C already in terms of letter grade. The schedule of topics is all just kind of tentative, you know, so I have a little date here and also the topic here. But <coughs> it's going to be off a little bit because, you know, I have to spend time to talk about the syllabus like today, so it's, not, it's going to be off. It's not going to be exactly on those particular days. All right, so when this is all done, make sure that you click the right, quote unquote, the, the, the correct you know, option here, turn it in so that the rest of the topics will show up on Moodle. So until I get the acknowledgement of the syllabus, you know, the topics won't open up automatically. Are there any questions about the syllabus? Yep. So 80% of our grade is tests. Is the other 20% assignments? Yep. The tests of this class is going to be mostly practical, practical stuff. In other words, I will give you a program, you know, an app to begin with, and I will just say, okay, I want you to extend this app to do A, B, and C also. Okay, so that's a fairly typical kind of question that it will ask in an exam. But it's all going to be open book and open notes. In other words, all the sample programs that I develop in class, you can use those. If you want to look up the App Inventor website to look up something, you can do that. Okay. Yep. Will it be an actual program in language? Um, in this class, I do not use an actual "quote unquote" programming language. We use App Inventor, which is really kind of cool because um, it makes it possible so that people do not have to take a programming language class before this one. 
So we'll, we'll see you know, uh, what it looks like you know, really soon. I'm going to give you guys a demonstration, especially during the lab time. I'll give you a really good demonstration of what to do. Okay. All right, so this is, so the next one is, let's see here. <clears throat> oh, I, th these are extra resources that I, I think some of you may find really interesting, if not for anything else. The, the environment that we use to develop, the, to develop apps is called App Inventor. And App Inventor, in some way, is like YouTube. In other, word, in other ways, they encourage a community of developers to share the projects. Okay, so if, some, if you, okay, let's say you have just written an app that you think is really great and other people may find it useful, you can upload it and share that with the community, just like YouTube. Okay, so other people can download your app, including the source code, and they can add stuff to it, they can enhance it, they can modify it, and so on and so forth. So they really you know, follow the open source uh, concept when it comes to sharing you know, projects and stuff like that. But this is also a great way to learn how to do something. Because some people may discover a technique to get something done that is kind of difficult for most people. You can look up their website, you can look up their project, download it, and find out exactly how they got it done. Then you can borrow their code in your own project. So this is a really great resource that I feel is a, is a great learning resource. And, um, okay, so. Is this what we'll be using to build yes. apps? Yep. Awesome. And it's really fairly easy. I so. Oh, you have used App Inventor? Yeah. yeah. Um, most people do not realize how powerful it is because it looks like a toy to it, to most people, uh, except you know there are things that you go like, wow, I did not know that App Inventor can do this. Yep. So we'll we'll talk about you know we'll use App Inventor as our environment for programming in this class. Okay. So any other questions before I give you a quick rundown on? development platforms because I need to make sure that all of you have a way to work on your homework assignments. Okay? All right, so let's move on to that one. Yep. Well, actually, uh, so uh, does App Inventor is mostly for client-side uh, code? We don't, do we write any server-side code ourselves? Or? We are not going to deal with client-server you know, type of modeling much. If you want to you know, like make your pro personal project really you know, out of the world, you can go ahead and do that, but I, that's beyond the scope of this class. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yep. You mentioned reading, but there's no text, right? The text is all in Moodle, so there are links here. You know, basically, you know, you, if you go through this, we have, you know, I have all the writings in here. All right. So what I'll do is I'm going to start on this particular survey. It's a survey. You know, I probably cannot take a survey. It helps you determine how you can write your apps and do your homework assignments. Okay. So the first question, you know, if you guys go, it will give you the, uh, it will ask you the questions. But since I am not going to be able to see that as a teacher, well, let me give you a try first. Pretty sure I cannot. <coughs> yeah, I'm not eligible to take this questionnaire because I am a teacher. So what I can do, mm, I don't want to do that either. Okay, I know, I know exactly what I should do. I can edit the questions so that you can see the questions. There we go. Okay, so the first question asks you, do you have a personal notebook computer they can bring to you to the class and the lab? So they can use that computer to work on the projects. The computer needs to run Windows, Mac OS X, or Linux. So it's fairly flexible. You can have you know, one, either one of the three operating systems. But you also need to have, you may need administrative rights to install some programs. It depends on the next question, okay? But you may not even need that. Assuming this computer runs Windows 10, you would need four gigs of RAM. Um, and also depending on, uh, depending on some other factors, you might benefit from a processor that has virtualization acceleration. Okay. So let me just address the four gigs of RAM part first. Uh, last year or last semester, I had one student with a inexpensive HP notebook computer that only had two gigs of RAM. 
um, she ran out of RAM space to get App Inventor running. So I now recommend at least four gigs of RAM on the notebook computer that you intend to use with this class. Okay? So if you have access to this, uh, to a computer like that, and you can bring it with you to the lab, it's great. Okay? It's not required, but you know this will give you the most flexibility because then you can work on your homework assignments anywhere you go. The second question asks you, do you have your own Android device and plan to bring it to class or lab and use it for homework assignments? Um, if you have an Android phone, you're all set. Okay? You know, it's an Android device. It doesn't matter what version of Android you're running as long as it is 2.3 or about. So the requirement is really, really low because I really doubt that anyone can still find an Android device that's running Android 2.3. Okay. That's like, you know, even for me, I don't change my phones or, or devices very often. That's like two generations ago already. So for most other people, that's like four generations ago. So I think most, you know, all Android devices are going to be fine. Okay. <clears throat> if you don't have your own Android device, don't worry. It is not required. Even though at, the, at this time, you can probably spend 40 or 50 bucks to buy an Android device. It's less expensive than most textbooks. And no one finds it amazing. <laughs> when I went to college, okay, a calculus textbook is like 100 bucks, but that's like many, many years ago. How much is a calculus textbook now? I just bought a C++ book and I was floored. It's like 170 bucks or something ridiculous. Wow. Uh, but why would, but why, why is there even a necessity for C and C++? It's completely open. Go to C++.com and you can look up anything you can possibly want to know about C++. For anything else, you can go to Stack. Uh, Stackoverflow.com, Stack 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 or just you know, just go to Google. Okay, you, I would not be surprised if there are like twenty YouTube video clips to explain how to use any particular concept in C++. So I just feel that you know, unless you know, it's a really obscure topic where you know you cannot find a lot of online resources, then a textbook is going to be useful. Even an older textbook would. Correct, but they don't have the, and the, the questions numbered you know, on the right pages. <laughs> yeah, so the question now is, yes, go ahead. So uh, I have a computer at home. Is there some in the labs, or will, it, will I not be able to get the homework? It will be fine. You can, you, can, you can do all your homework at home as well. OK. Yeah, but if you have one that you can bring with you, or if you find a way to work on your homework assignment in the lab, then I can interact with you when you run into problems. So what I do get from the, the what I do in the lab to home? Yes. Okay. It is all ho uh, web hosted. Okay. So there's no way for anyone to lose homework assignments in this class. Okay. Whatever you do is web hosted. It's cloud hosted. Yep. Will the virtual Android device work on the Linux? Yes, it would. As I will illustrate very shortly. Okay. So the next question, so these two questions are very important because depending on your answers to these two questions, you basically will fall into one of these four cells in a table. So you can see the green stuff. The green stuff means you're all set up, okay? Easy peasy. The yellow one is the only one that is kind of tricky. You want to use the lab computer and you don't have an Android device. That's the only one that makes it a little bit tricky. The reason why it's a little bit tricky is, um, as a student, you do not, and even I as an instructor, do not have permission to install any software on a computer, either here or in the lab. And you do need to install the virtual machine if you need to run a virtual Android device. So that makes it kind of challenging, but not impossible, okay? So it can still be done, but you will need to use a live uh, Linux distribution on a USB thumb drive, then you will still be able to do it. Okay, um, some of you saw how I rebooted the machine into Linux, and all I did is to use an external hard drive to do that. 
Okay, I did not pre-install Linux on this machine. I have a live distribution that will basically run on just about any PC platform that can boot from a USB drive. So that's the solution to the yellow spot, you know, where uh, somebody wants to use a lab computer and want to use a virtual Android device also. Okay, so now is a good time. We have about mm, 10 minutes or so. So it's a good time for me to give you a quick rundown of what it looks like when you're writing your program in the uh, App Inventor. So the first thing you do is you go to the App Inventor website. Okay. <clears throat> And you're more than welcome to follow the links and stuff like that, but I'm just going to jump all the way to create apps here, which will ask you to sign in using one of your Google accounts. It doesn't really matter which one, okay? So you can use the school one if you want to use it, or you can use your personal account. Just kind of keep all your stuff in the same spot, if you will. So I just say, you know, use my usual Gmail account, and that brings you to the development environment. This is all web. This is just a web page. So your project is actually hosted in the cloud, and and as, as a result, it's impossible to lose anything because it's stored in the cloud. Well, I wouldn't say impossible, but it's unlikely that you will lose anything. And this is a notice here, and I think I got this installed already. So I just click continue, and let's say I want to start a new project. Okay, so I start a new project, give it a name. Um, first class, it creates the project and immediately bring me into the development environment that looks like this. And remember, I'm still in the browser. You don't have to install the development environment at all. It's really just a website, okay? So now we can start to do stuff in here. I'm just gonna do something really simple. So I put in like two text boxes and a button and a, and a label, okay? So I put in a text box here. Now because of the screen resolution issue, it will keep trying to scroll, so it's kind of annoying. But when you do this on a regular computer, it won't do that because you're not, you don't have a zooming issue. Okay, so two buttons, uh, excuse me, two text boxes, a button, and also a label. All I want to do is to add two numbers, okay? So I put a label here. And with the button, I want to change the text on the button to say add, like that. So what I want to do is I want people to be able to enter a number here, a number here, click the add button, and then the sum will be displayed here. That's all I want to do, okay? <clears throat> so the interface is all done, and if you want to, you can also change screen one, which is just the caption of the screen, to something else. You can change the title of the screen and just say add two oops, numbers, like that. All right, so now I have to specify the code. Now, this is the really, really cool part, okay? If you do this in Java, even if you know Java before this class, but new to Android the framework, you probably need 20 tabs in the browser open in about, I would say, at least half an hour to get this program done, okay? Because there's just a lot of details to, that you have to look up. It's not a matter of understanding. It's a matter of, okay, which class do I need here? How do I hook up this object to that object? Blah, 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 blah. Just a whole lot of details to deal with. In App Inventor, this is what you do. You go to Blocks, which is basically your program, and it has a little cool backpack here. We will explain what a backpack is for. It's really help. It's really useful. So what you do is you go to the thing, it's object-oriented programming, so you have to identify which object is going to respond to a click. Well, it's going to be a button, okay? So you start with a button click, and you can see it is all drag and drop, okay? So now you say, you can specify the code, what action do I want the application to take when button one is clicked? Okay. Are you okay? So now I can say, oh, I just want to add two numbers, okay? And I want to display the result in label one. <coughs> so I go to label one, and I say, okay, I want label one to show the answer as its text, okay? But what is going to be the text? Oh, it's going to be the sum of two numbers. So we go to math, and we specify the addition, okay? What am I adding? Oh, the two things in the text boxes. 
one is in text box one so you can say okay I need to know what is the text in text box one put it into the first slot and do the same thing with text box two figure out what is in what is the text in text box two like that that's it this is the app that can add two numbers from two text boxes now it doesn't have error checking and stuff like that it doesn't have fancy stuff but the basic basic core of functionality <coughs> is here yes so does this like automatically cast the text to an integer yeah do things like because I was just thinking um, it does so uh, how do you can you is there a way to kind of like check the actual yep. little up code because it feels to me like if you just do this uh, it's possible to just inadvertently like introduce an error with all the casting you're yes doing. so to use my own scale this is worth a C <laughs> <laughs> it's sloppy there's a lot of stuff it doesn't do that where it really should be doing it doesn't do error checking doesn't do any type checking and stuff like that it's sloppy but it gets it gets the, the, the core of functionality in so that's a good example of you know something that's worth a letter grade of C <laughs> just acceptable okay so but the but the point of this illustration which I have another three two minutes or so is how do I get this to work to test it just to see it working okay so what in Linux is there's one extra step you know which is uh, I have to find um, commands and I have to start the emulator um, AI started that's all okay so once I have this started I go back to the browser and I go to connect to emulator and what this does is it, it's starting up the, the, em, the emulator on the PC um, does anyone have any questions about what a virtual machine is or what an emulator does this is a good illustration okay I don't really have a physical device but it's running it out of virtualization or as a virtual machine so now I have a virtual Android device for debugging yes so the, the browser is able to just automatically see that is that running on like local port or something that's the trick here the trick is you have to get uh, AI starter installed so that's why you need to have administra administrative right to get this installed if you want to use a virtual machine. Okay, but it's starting and it's uh, it's not done yet. Okay, it still has to go through a few more steps, uh, and it's going to complain the uh, companion is out of date and it wants to reinstall and restart the whole thing. <clears throat> yep. So right here it says it's out of date. Click OK to start the update. So it's already it's it, it, the web page is actually remotely controlling the virtual machine, which if you think about it is really kind of cool. Okay, yeah, replace and we'll go ahead and click OK to re, to reinstall it. The warning here says you know when update finishes, click done. Don't don't click open, and then restart the whole thing. So it's reinstalling the application. You only have to do this once. So once again, we click done and not open. And then what we want to do here is to restart the virtual machine by resetting the connection and restarting the emulator. All you need is a USB drive that's about eight gigabytes. Okay, how much is an eight gig a USB thumb drive these days? Five bucks. Five bucks. Okay, so it's much less than a textbook. So by <laughs> so by not needing a textbook for this class, you have enough money to buy a USB thumb drive with about eight gigs of capacity. That's fair. <laughs> <clears throat> so it's it's starting. Uh, let's see. Nope, it's fine. Oh, okay. So you can see the application actually running here. Let me let me switch back to this screen. Go back to the designer view. This is all kind of pretend, but this is the actual. Okay. So let's check whether it works or not. Okay. So let's try to add two numbers. So we'll add 
This is really clumsy because it doesn't actually let me type something on the keyboard of the PC. So I actually have to use the virtual keyboard here. So let's say we want to add 200 to, oh, I don't know, 456. Okay. So the answer should be 656. So I click the add button and it shows me the answer as 656. Okay. So you can write an app in just about no time. Okay. So compared to the other approach of using Java and the Android development platform, uh, they call it Android Studio now, just 10 minutes is not enough to, to download <laughs> Android Studio. Okay? You get all the tools installed just to understand how to interact with a text box, a button, and a label, and the framework of how everything else works. That's going to take you about 30 minutes, okay? even if you know Java inside and out already. So this is the environment that we're going to use for this class for the entire semester. Yep, go ahead. Can you see the code as well? Is there, is there a way to see the code? Can you just it, yes, the code is actually in the blocks side and not the designer block, designer side. So if you click blocks, you see the code here. Is that, oh, you mean the Java code? Yeah, I mean the Java code. No, unfortunately, you don't get the Java code. Now, Sorry. if you're really curious, okay? Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, the only way I've been able to is to download the APK, and then you open it up in a different piece of software. Like yeah, but, it, but then it's already bytecode, so you have to use a decompiler right. to decompile the right. bytecode back into Java code. Yeah. Um, there's one alternative, okay? If you go to projects and you say, uh, export selected project to my computer, it will download, I know you guys cannot see because of the contrast. Uh, it has an extension of AIA, which stands for App Inventor Application. Um, this is a zip file. You can, you can rename it to something.zip in Windows and unzip it. Uh, and inside is the actual quote unquote source code in App Inventor. So you can actually do surgical operations on your program using this technique. Not recommended, okay, we are still way too early in this stage to do this, but that's something that you can do. I know, thank you, Bob. So we are running out of time, I have to close up, you know, and we're gonna move to the lab, okay? Oh, that way. Is the app inventor a source? Yes, it is. Okay.